taking the stage. Uh, Brian Baker uh, will be next um, uh, sharing information of, uh, about the, let's see, uh, comparison of European and North American organic agriculture research policies. So Brian. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. So Mark set the stage for uh, a presentation. So Europe, North America, two continents um, separated by an ocean and um, common culture. So we have uh, a uh, situation where organic agriculture and the market for organic agriculture is um, uh, predominantly in these in these two trading spheres. So um, it, uh, in in terms of production, uh, Europe has a, a higher percentage of arable land uh, that's that's in organic production, uh, but the U.S. has a larger market, and um, we're, we're looking at a larger market share as well. So, um, you know, the U.S. is the largest global market for organic food. It's 44% of the world market. I mean, we, uh, we eat a lot of organic food here. So, um, and there's a lot of, um, there's a wide range within both um, continents of, of how much organic agriculture is, is practiced. In, in the U.S., it's predominantly on the coasts, and uh, here in the North Central region, um, not so much in the Deep South. Um, similarly, in, in Europe, um, you know, the former Soviet bloc countries, um, organic has not, not uh, become so widely practiced, but you have um, very high adoption rates in Northern Europe, uh, like in Scandinavia. And uh, Europe uh, is mainly talking about the European Union, which is 28 member states. There are a couple of non-member states that sort of get lumped in, Switzerland, Norway, um, and some of the internal microstates like um, Monaco, Andorra, uh, Liechtenstein. Um, and, well, uh, so you, you also have non-members and I'm not going to talk about them so much, um, except they are um, significant in terms of, of trade in some cases. So um, North America, I'm pretty much talking about the U.S. and Canada. Mexico is part of NAFTA, but for statistical purposes and other reasons, Mexico usually is con included with Latin America, Central and South America rather than North America. So I'm going to focus on, on the U.S. and Canada. Um, Mexico, I, I will note, however, Mexico is our largest um, export, I, I, is the uh, largest source of imports in, into the U.S., of, of organic imports, yes. Uh, so there, there is a significant impact there uh, in terms of the market. Um, and here's the geographical distribution I was talking about. Uh, where you see a large concentration of farms here in Wisconsin, in Iowa, California, New York, Maine, uh, the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, a fair amount in, in Florida and, and uh, Carolina, Virginia, but really not a lot in the, in the Mid-South. Um, so in terms of the European initiatives, for organic research, uh, it, it really began like in the U.S. We had uh, the Low Input Sustainable Agriculture Program, LISA. They had QLIF, the Quality Low Input Food Program. Um, and then Core Organics. Um, I'll talk a little bit about strategies for organic and low input breeding and management. Um, sometime on technology platform, uh, the, the European uh, Organic Technology Platform, which uh, Mark mentioned, one for France, um, and then different member states' initiatives, and, and briefly, 
touch on private sector contributions. So um, brought a copy brought a copy of this report and it covers pretty much what's happened over the past uh, uh, over the over the first 12 years since the European Commission um, began recognizing um, organic as a priority. Um, and you know since that time um, there's there's been a um, significant amount of European Union resources devoted to organic agriculture research along with um, member state matching contributions. Um, the QLIF program, you had um, a broad consortium, 31 partners, 17 countries. Um, these included non-member states, uh, Switzerland, Israel, and Turkey. Um, and get this, the, there first priority was food quality. And you go to talks in America, you know, a lot of times people will say, um, especially government officials will say, America has the safest food in the world. And you go to European talks and Europeans will say, Europe has the highest quality food in the world. So a little bit different emphasis on, on priorities. So, um, and they, they wanted to know what consumer expectations were and how they should meet, uh, how they should be met. Um, and they were explicitly instructed to investigate the health claims being made about organic food. So, but also the, what are the, what are the bottlenecks? And, um, the, but a lot of it had to do with um, creating networks and then Core Organics was formed, um, which is the coordination of European transnational research on organic food and farming. So um, there were, um, you know, EU funds plus member states, um, you know, 11 member states um, making contribu contributions into a, into a joint pool. And the, the first part was getting access to the information. So they created um, organic eprints, which is a, a database that has, um, it, it serves as a repository for organic farming research that's, that's available open access. And um, also to, to get these different organizations together, different institutions together to, um, to partner on, on research. Then the, then the real game began in uh, 2007. So they built this common pool and uh, or a common pot, and you had unequal contributions from the different member states. Member states uh, that kicked in more thought they should get more. Member states that had less capacity thought they needed more to build capacity. And uh, they're still talking about it. So um, anyway, no, they've, they've actually moved ahead on, on quite a bit of that. But there was, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, there, there were a number of projects, and again, they're they're all outlined in, in the report how the uh, how it was allocated and, and what the outcomes were. Strategies for organic and low input breeding and management a consortium of the different uh, of different public and private uh, plant breeding institutions, uh, research institutions. Um, this was. Uh, um, spearheaded by INRA and um, had, had uh, participants in, in 11 countries, um, not all of which were in the EU. They, uh, they made a priority to work with, with developing countries as well um, and supported participatory breeding programs. They actually at one point were partnering with ICARDA, which is one of the CGIAR, CGIAR centers, Consultative Group on International Agriculture Research. Um, and that didn't last, but um, they, be, they formed a, a structure that um, carried on with participatory plant breeding and worked on improved genetics for nine different crops. Um, 
they had a budget of 6 million euros over five years. That was the EU contribution, and there was about an equal amount from the member states. So similar project went on with, with animal uh, breeding. A lot of this was conservation biology, the uh, uh, conservation of heritage breeds that were adapted for local conditions in Europe, um, and also looking at suitability for low input and organic conditions in particular, what breeds are the good grazers, which ones are disease resistant, don't need a lot of animal drug treatments, uh, which breeds are resistant to parasites. Again, it was a participatory approach and um, farmer organizations um, became partners and um, exchanged genetic material. Um, and uh, finally, they had a mandate of um, coming up with, with uh, research on what constitutes ethical treatment and what are consumer expectations um, about livestock management. Um, TP Organics is, uh, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about. Um, TP Organics is a technology platform. Now, what is a technology platform? It's really um, a consortium of, of stakeholders. You, you get all these different organizations that have an interest in the outcomes of organic research or, or of a specific title uh, or a specific topic. Um, the European Union has created a number of technology platforms, any, everything from electronics to automobiles, and um, it is their vehicle in Brussels bureaucratic speak of having officially recognized public-private partnerships. So very, very European approach, something it took a long time for me to, to understand what's going on. Um, but, but at the bottom, at the end of the day, you've, you've got the, uh, the farmers' organizations, the research institutions, um, you know, business interests, national interests, and the TP Organics is unique among the different technology platforms in Europe because it's the only one that includes civil society um, and non-governmental organizations that are um, not business associations or um, trade associations. So um, you've got well-established programs in uh, those areas where there's high adoption of organic farming. Um, in Germany, Denmark, uh, and, uh, well, you know, in the, in the German-speaking countries, in the Scandinavian countries, um, a, as well as in the UK, um, you have um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of national initiatives that go back before EU support, the same for France, as, as Mark pointed out. Um, with, with Germany, you've got um, estimated annual 68 million uh, in, uh, going to various multiple uh, publicly funded institutions throughout Germany that have the capacity for doing organic research uh, and education. Um, how much of it is, is actually research and, and is allocated for other resources or for other purposes is not clear. Um, but you also have ECROFs in, in Denmark um, and, um, and in Rhine, France. But the um, rest of Europe, it's not been so bright. Um, austerity measures have shut down programs in Greece and in, in Spain and Portugal. Um, the UK has had uh, cutbacks under the current conservative government. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, you know, continued weakening of the, of the euro might have, um, might have implications. There's, there's still a lag in 
the former Soviet blocs and the Balkan states are uh, have pretty much not you know, have not much of anything going on. Um, the uh, you you do have a lot of um, private support. Um, there's the institute where I worked in Switzerland, Bibel, which is uh, translates into the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture, and they have about a 20 million, a 22 million dollar a year budget, um, 120 staff, and um, pretty well well supported uh, by a, a healthy mix of public and private support. Um, one of the oldest is the Elm Farm, uh, started by Lady Balfour. Um, it's a, a project, a pet project of Prince Charles, and they get uh, support from um, his his duchy brand. That's a, that's a mixed blessing because um, it's it's had an effect of possibly um, discouraging. People assume that they've got plenty, and and really that's that's just there's there's expected to be a match there, and. Um, that hasn't necessarily translated into, uh, you know, crown support hasn't necessarily translated into governmental support. Um, so, um, Louis Bolk Institute um, in Drybergen, the Netherlands, they've uh, done a lot of work on uh, nutrition and quality and also on plant breeding. Um, and of course, Mark mentioned ETOB. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on North America. Uh, people in the audience, I'm sure, understand the situation. I, you know, Matt went over it earlier. Uh, you know, several people here <laughs> know the the latest situation more than I do. Um, but um, you know, there's there's public and private capacity in the U.S. Um, going back um, to the 1970s with the Rodale Research Center. Um, and now um, several ARS facilities and land-grant universities have certified organic. Um, uh, yeah, most most land-grant universities now have some organic acres, some certified organic research plots. Um, but um, there's been a decline, and how much I'm trying to figure out. There's been a decline in private sector support and private sector capacity, and I I like to hear a discussion on why that is. Um, and Canada deserves attention because it's, it's stable and functional, but at, a, at an early stage, and it's, it's spread really thin over a broad territory, and they're pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. Um, Matt uh, talked earlier about OREI. He also mentioned IOP. Um, we've got uh, full appropriation for 14. Uh, we're probably best off forgetting what happened in 13 with the sequester and government shutdown and no farm bill. Um, but uh, you know you're you're looking at a situation with national competition. Um, IOP is relatively new. I don't really didn't really go into any depth with that. Um, SARE has funded a lot of organic projects over the years. It's regionally distributed. Um, uh, one complaint that I've heard about OREI relative to SARE is that it, it favors the, the areas that have really strong organic agriculture support and disfavors those underserved areas in particular, the South. Um, and SARE makes up for some of that, but um, there's still uh, some hard feelings there about that. Um, want to recognize the work of the Organic Farming Research Foundation and how they've been tracking over the years the um, increase in um, organic agriculture research capacity at the different land-grant universities, the, uh, both the Morrill Act and 1890 colleges. Um, but again, it, you know, it's, it's um, Spotty, uh, you know, some really bright shining stars and some very, uh, very empty areas. Um, so you've had this um, increase in capacity that 
that's taken place since the official recognition of the USDA. There were state programs, as, there, as in Europe, um, different US states um, recognized and funded at organic agriculture before it was federally recognized. Um, but um, it's, it's really, uh, you know, we're, we're still not at 100% in terms of having all states on board. Um, wanted to recognize Ceres Trust and encourage people to get um, the, uh, the latest report. And um, I'll defer to Jim's expertise and knowledge of, of the study and what, what's happened. Um, I wanted to move on to um, wrapping up with um, call for international organic research collaboration. So Europe has clearly made international collaboration a priority. They funded several projects and have brought in people to work from outside the EU. Um, the US also has language that um, that uh, requires, you could say, uh, shall facilitate access by research extension professionals. Uh, um, to organic research conducted outside the United States. So there's, um, there's language um, in the Farm Bill that, that encourages collaboration, um, but it really, uh, it's really hard to say how that's intended to be implemented. Um, brief picture about the um, status of nonprofits. Um, we've got, uh, uh, this picture where um, there was definitely a decline in, in um, the, uh, the amount of revenues that, that went into uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, and a lot of this is uh, based on the uh, financial crisis uh, beginning in 2007, 2008. Um, and there's there's been a recovery, um, but we're you know barely back to to where we were, um, you know, six or seven years ago. Um, Want to talk briefly? One thing we do have that Europe doesn't have, we've got farmers that just they they don't wait for for research. They don't wait for government. They're going to do it themselves. And we have a DIY ethic that really doesn't exist in Europe. And when I was invited to speak um, to a group of um, Flemish researchers with three farmers in the room, they wanted to know, well, you know, there's all this stuff coming out of America. How, how do you do it? I mean, what, you know, these, these farmers, how do you get them to innovate? And what I said is you can't stop them from innovating. I mean, it's just that's what they do, you know. And um, a lot of it's open source, grassroots, farmer to farmer, um, farmers getting together. And it's just, this is, it's um, hard to explain um, to people who, who haven't experienced it or um, know uh, about it firsthand how to, how to build these kinds of structures. And, you know, I think that's, that's one of the great strengths we have to build on here. Um, Canada, um, they have the Organic Agriculture System, uh, Center of Canada, and they are um, looking at um, the uh, support of, of communities throughout Canada um, and uh, it's, it's very much consumer and community oriented. Um, they're, they're trying to establish a uh, national network, a big country. They have um, partners, they have clusters, science clusters which partner researchers and, and farmers uh, in, in every 
uh, in every province. So um, there's um, significant private sector support and, and the Canadian Ministry made it clear that they were not going to support um, the research unless they could show significant private sector contributions. So it, it was imperative that they raise a certain amount of money from the industry and from the trade before um, before they they could get federal funds. So um, I, I wanted to move on to um, technology innovation platform of iPhone, and um, this is a an initiative of an international umbrella organization called the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. It's a, a sector group that works on technology transfer research and development. Um, and um, the mission is to foster international collaboration in organic agriculture research. So um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, at a membership meeting, uh, we came up with these four goals to facilitate global access to information on organic farming and food systems, facilitate interactions between researchers and the beneficiaries of research development and technology transfer, um, assist iPhone and the entire organic movement with scientific evidence-based advocacy, and uh, to increase the number of researchers, educators, and extensionists working with organic farming systems. So to conclude, organic agriculture research in both the Europe in, in both Europe and North America lags behind market growth. We've seen um, at the beginning um, that uh, we, market shares that are larger than um, research shares. Europe has built more capacity in organic agriculture research than North, than North America has. Um, but that capacity is unevenly distributed on both continents. What seems to be the common theme is that where there's strong public sector, where there's strong, I'm sorry, where there's strong private sector support um, and a strong farmer base, there's much more likely to be a, uh, uh, a public assistance in, in that effort and that the countries and institutions that have the capacity or able to capitalize on the on the grant making opportunities. Um, in the US, especially in the private sector, it's been flat and there's some signs of recovery. Um, we, we see a certain flattening out in Europe as well, um, despite continued growth in the uh, in the uh, demand and market for organic. Um, Europe has um, actively encouraged international cooperation. It hasn't always worked out, but sometimes it has. The U.S. Uh, also mentions international cooperation, but it doesn't seem to be um, as widely practiced. And um, it's, it's my uh, contention that international cooperation can only help us advance the state of science in organic agriculture research. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Uh, are there any questions for Brian? And Kathleen can uh, start getting switched over here. We got a question back here from Dave Engel. So, Brian, this on? Brian, um, so it, to me, it, it sounds like a chicken and egg thing. So, what's coming first? You said in Europe, there's not any D DIY. Um, initiative or mindset, but uh, even in the United States, uh, it seems to me that I mean we are, I mean we're reaching a point where it's it's very exciting to have this research, but really in in reality, it's still the farmer that uh, is driving it, isn't it? I agree, yeah, and, and I think we, we need to look to a farmer first, farmer last, and you know, frankly, researcher-driven research is 
pretty boring. I mean, it's it's just very circular. You did, uh, you know. I mean, sure, researchers want to work on what's interesting to them, but if there's if it's not solving a, a need that's identified by farmers as a priority, or it results in um, a, a technology transfer that's not really feasible for whatever reason, you can't deliver it, deliver the goods to the farmer, it, it's not going to go anywhere. And I'll just add to that that one of the criteria we have at Series Trust, and it's also in OREI, and it goes back to the leadership from the Organic Farming Research Foundation is evidence of need, but also evidence of farmer involvement in the design and the implementation of the research. So I think that helps keep some of this research grounded. Exactly. All, all, every step along the way. David. Yeah, just to, to be a fly in the way, I, mean, I, I think it's got to be a mixed bag because what we experience a lot with some of our commodities they fund research based totally on grower demand, but it's the problem du jour. And so there's no vision for the long term. How many farmers are going to say climate change is a priority five or ten years ago? So somebody has to be thinking in the bigger picture, longer term, as well as solving the problems of today. We need both. So I, I just want to say I don't think it's either or. Good point, good point. And there, there certainly is policy-driven research um, and, and donor-driven research. There's also um, market-driven research. You know, input suppliers want to sell more inputs. So, you know, you, you have different priorities. But at the end of the day, uh, it's going to rely, agri you know, applied agricultural research is going to rely on farmer adoption. So I, I agree with you in terms of how priorities are set. Um, I can even agree with you in terms of validation of results that a lot of controlled replicated experiments don't necessarily need to involve farmers, but um, the, the, um, at the end of the day, farmer adoption is going to determine whether, whether it uh, prevails or not. Okay, one more quick question, comment, and then we move on. So Brian, in the previous session, you had said you had asked some questions about definitions of concepts, and I'm wondering uh, if you've given any thought to what that would look like in an international context. You know, it's one thing to be working with people in the British Isles; at least we sort of speak the same language. But you start to get into some of the other languages, and I think there are some real um, barriers. Well, I mean, it goes beyond. Uh, simply language. I mean, I you know, one of the interesting things about living in Switzerland is that uh, the the Germans think they don't speak German, but uh, you know, they're they're separated by a common language as well. Really, I, I think we need to we need to look at it more systemically, and and I would bring it back home more to North America that. Um, Farmers in the Maritimes have more in common with farmers in New England than they have with farmers in Saskatchewan. Farmers in Ontario are facing many of the same problems as farmers in upstate New York. Um, you know, the Pacific Northwest includes British Columbia as well as Washington and Oregon. Um, there are barriers. There, there is, uh, you know, there are cultural differences, but I, I think those can be overcome. To everyone joining us online, uh, that was our last session for this particular session, um, and we will be back at 6 p.m. Central Time for our keynote with Chuck Benbrook. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for joining us.